Welcome to today's Healthcare 2000 Presidential Healthcare Forum. My name is Chip Kahn and I am President of the Federation of American Hospitals. We are organizing this event today with Families USA and it is my pleasure to bring you Ron Pollack, Executive Director of Families USA, who will introduce this morning's program. Ron. Thank you, Chip. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, our third presidential forum on health care. Health care has become the number one domestic issue in the elections. And so we wanted to make sure that this very important issue didn't get the normal 30-second and 60-second sound bites. So we've organized these forums with four very distinguished journalists so that we could explore health care in greater depth. Before I introduce our distinguished guest, I want to thank a few people who made this possible. First, I want to thank uh, McNeil Era Productions that is producing all of these forums. I want to thank uh, the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, which is hosting us in this wonderful facility and that is webcasting all of these forums. I want to thank the funders, the California Endowment and the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. And last but not least, I want to thank my good colleague, <clears throat> Mary Ellen Barreca, who has been coordinating these forums for Families USA. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our very special guest today, Congressman Dennis Kucinich. Please welcome him. <laughs> Thank you. Good to have you here. I'm going to say a few words about that. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Congressman uh, Kucinich uh, is the only presidential candidate uh, who is promoting what many people call a single-payer health care system. Some People used to call it national health insurance. Some people call it Medicare for all. And while he's the only presidential candidate promoting this, he is joined by a significant number of his Democratic colleagues in the House in pushing a similar proposal. So we're delighted to have you here, and we look forward to your sharing our, your views with us about America's health care system. Welcome. Thank you very much. So Thank you. Great. I want to turn this over uh, to our moderator, who's the chief health correspondent for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, Susan Denser. Thank you very much, Ron. And let me also welcome you, Congressman Kucinich. We're all very happy to be here today to participate in this important forum. I have the pleasure now of introducing my journalistic colleagues who will join me in questioning you today. They are Laura Meckler of the Wall Street Journal, Julie Rovner of National Public Radio, and Rick Klein of ABC News. As you know, by prearrangement with the campaigns of each candidate participating in these forums, we've given each of you the same first question in advance to allow you to craft a five-minute statement at the outset. And we follow the same approach with the closing question, as I'll spell out a bit later. For the other questions, we've allowed you and all the other candidates up to two minutes for each response and up to one minute for each follow-up question. Congressman, you have our opening question, which is this. Do you believe all Americans should have health insurance? And if so, and if you are elected president, how will you move toward this goal? Health care is a basic right in a democratic society. So yes, I believe that all Americans should have uh, health coverage. Now, when you say health insurance, we have to define some terms here. I'm the only candidate uh, running who's talking about a single payer, not-for-profit health care system, Medicare for all. It's H.R. 676 is legislation that enables such a system. And I'm the co-author of that legislation. As a matter of fact, over the last few years, I have organized dozens of members of Congress on this issue. I, right now, we have 83 members of the House of Representatives who have signed on in support of H.R. 676. And most of them I have contacted personally and discussed this legislation at length. And many of them I've appeared in their districts to speak about the urgency of a health care plan which recognizes health as a basic right in a democratic society. None of the other candidates will take the stand that I'm taking. And the American people have a right to, to ask why. I mean, when you consider that Senator Edwards, Senator Clinton have plans that are very similar to Mitt Romney and Governor Schwarzenegger, 
You have to ask, can the maintenance of a for-profit system serve the American people? And I don't believe that it can. I think that when you consider that you have 47 million Americans who are uninsured and another 50 million Americans who are underinsured, I mean, there's, there's one major problem. That is, with the uninsured, people just can't afford it. So when Senator Clinton and Senator Edwards say, well, they have a great idea. Everyone has to have health insurance. OK, uh, how do you afford it? If you can't afford it under the current system, how are you going to afford it under this system if you have a mandate to buy it? And if you do buy it, then you're forcing the plans that inevitably are going to have uh, extraordinary co-pays and deductibles or a limited, and such a limited level of coverage. What I'm talking about is a plan where everyone's covered. It covers everything. And the fact is we're already paying for it. We're just not getting it. 16% of our gross domestic product spent for health care. That's about $2.3 trillion a year. If we took all that money for health care, we'd have enough to cover everyone. Vision care, dental care, mental health care, hearing care, prescription drugs, long-term care, all covered. But instead what's happening, health is being used as an engine to accelerate the wealth of the nation upwards. Half the bankruptcies in America are connected directly to people not being able to pay hospital bills. Now think about that. Here you have working families, and they cannot afford to be able to have the kind of coverage their family needs in order to assure them against being driven into poverty. How can we permit this to happen in the United States? How can our political system stand by and let so many people uh, lose their homes, so many people have their families destroyed financially because of an illness? I mean, this is a moral imperative. Health care is a basic right in a democratic society. And I'll tell you, this is a question that both political parties have to face. I stand here having taken this issue to the Democratic Platform Committee in the year 2000 and again in the year 2004. And both times it was rejected. And both times it was rejected because of the influence which the insurance companies have on the Democratic Party. This isn't a partisan issue. Both parties have failed the American people. And I'm running for president, understanding that it is true that the top domestic priority must be to meet the health care needs of the people. Families are, are having an extraordinary difficulty making ends meet in this economy. Wages have flattened for many working people. Their, their, their benefits have shrunk. A lot of employers have just canceled health insurance outright, leaving people on their own. So what do you do? How do you take care of your family under this circumstance? You can't. Almost one out of every three Americans is affected directly by this. And indirectly, I guess it probably affects most, if not all of us. It doesn't matter what your income is. It doesn't matter how much money you have. A single illness in a family can destroy any family financially. Why should that be? Why should people work a lifetime to be able to achieve a, a, a home, you know, just a little something in terms of retirement security, and then you find out an illness comes and you lose it all? So to me, you know, when I run for president of the United States, I can't be bought or bossed by any interest group. And let's face it, one of the reasons why we have these candidates who are debating narrow parameters about what kind of a private for profit healthcare system you have. It's because of the influence of the insurance company interest and the pharmaceutical company interest on the political process. It's because of the money they put in to the political process and to the candidates. Inevitably, it becomes a debate not about health care, but about insurance care. I'm the one candidate, the one candidate who stands here for and with the American people. And I do so with an understanding of what people go through. Congressman, given that you're the only candidate proposing a national health system, do you think that there is realistically any chance it could be adopted by the Congress or broadly supported by the American public? With leadership, yes. The American public's ready for this. Are you kidding? I mean, people realize why they can't afford health insurance. And most people understand that insurance companies make money not providing health care. So the American people want this. And 83 members of Congress have now signed on. With the proper political leadership, with dynamic political leadership, with courageous political leadership that's ready to take out these interest groups, absolutely you could have a not-for-profit system. When FDR was faced with having to put together an economy that was in a shambles because of the depression, because of the, uh, the, the collapse of the stock market, he had to craft a new deal. And when he took that program to the American people, they, respond, they responded resoundingly. And they gave him a Congress that gave him the ability to push through a new deal. So I, you know, this is the kind of thing you have to take right to the American people. And I believe, they'll, I believe they'll respond. But you need leadership to do it. That's why who we nominate as Democrats makes a difference. 
if we nominate someone who's in the pocket of the insurance industry, forget it. You know, then, then, then the people will be told, well, you have this narrow concern. You can have this product from a private health insurer or this product from a private health insurer. I mean, essentially, Senator Clinton's plan back 15 years ago or 14 years ago was to have competition between private entities. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a not-for-profit system. And so, yes, the American people are, uh, are ready with the leadership I can provide. Thank you, Congressman. And our next question will come from Rick Klein of ABC News. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. You mentioned H.R. 676 and just wanted to explore some of the details of that. It actually seems like it's more than a single payer system that you're talking about. Uh, it's not just the government paying the health care bills. It's actually more analogous, it seems, that to the national health system of the United Kingdom, where uh, you have a new system that would be delivering care, uh, building new facilities, purchasing new equipment. Are you really talking about government financed and government delivered health care, aren't you? My God, can you imagine a government being involved in something? I mean, think about this. Uh, the government's not going to run all the hospitals. What happens is that all of the assets in America that are for profit would be converted to not for profit. That's the first thing to keep in mind. What the government will do is it will pay the bills with a single payer. There's enormous savings that are involved in that. Currently, Medicare costs about 2 to 3 percent to handle the paperwork. When you look at the for-profit insurance companies, the cost of paperwork is about 15 to 30 percent. So right there, you're talking about saving hundreds of billions of dollars a year just in going from uh, this system where you have so many different payers to a single payer. So, so that's, that's the one thing. Now, the undertone of your question, uh, Mr. Klein, is that uh, this is a, quote, government system. Uh, Social Security is uh, a government retirement system. People pay into it, of course. Uh, we have Medicare right now that's uh, government financed. Um, people pay taxes and they get all kinds of services from the government. At a, at a local level, people pol have police and fire and waste collection and street repair and street cleaning. I mean, one of the things we have to decide here is health care a right or is it a privilege? If it's a right, then it's appropriate for the government to have a role in facilitating that right. If it's a privilege and it's a market-based thing, then we're left to the predations of the market, which is if you can't pay for it, you're out of luck. That's all. And you know what? 47 million Americans are now out of luck. 50 million Americans are underinsured. So yes, the government has a role in the system. No question about it. Is it like the UK? It's probably you know, somewhat similar. In that, and it's similar to, uh, in, in uh, form to many uh, of the industrial democracies of the world, which provide health care for their people. Thank you. But we're talking about the same federal government that was responsible for, the, for paying the bills in the response to Hurricane Katrina. I mean, this is it's a federal government that's really mistrusted by a lot of folks uh, to, to deliver services and to deliver goods. It, why is it a good idea, in your view, to have government take over health care uh, in addition to the responsibilities that are already being covered that you mentioned. I, I, listen, I know. We're talking about the, uh, the federal government that took us into a war based on lies, that's prepared to take us into another war based on lies. Well, we are talking about government, but it's also government of the people. And if we let the health, the private sector control this, which is where we're at, then what we're looking at is health care being used as an engine to accelerate the wealth of the, na of the nation upwards, just like our housing policies accelerate the wealth of the nation upward, just like our credit policies and our monetary policies accelerate national wealth upwards, just like our energy policies accelerate national wealth upwards. So we have to ask the question, is health care a right? Because if it's a right, then there's a proper role for government. Look, I'm not here saying that government's perfect. It's not. But you know what? The problem in America today is that government, government's inability to function, I believe, is largely due to the fact that it's run by these various interest groups. The reason why government can't have a decent energy policy is because the oil companies control our energy policy. The, government, the reason why government can't have decent monetary policies is because they're run by banks and, and, and uh, credit uh, card companies in their own interest. So I'm talking about a novel idea, government in the public interest. Uh, you know, I know it takes a while for people to wrap their thinking around this, but government in the public interest. It actually Government can work for people. It's, it's working for somebody. This idea that government doesn't work, oh no. I've been doing this for 40 years, OK? I've been involved in public life for 40 years. Government works. The question is, 
Who is it working for? And in healthcare, it's working for the insurance companies right now. It's working for the pharmaceutical companies. You look at their profits. You look at their Wall Street ratings. And I'll tell you something. When I'm president of the United States, it'll work for the people. Thank you, Congressman. And, Congressman, we'll move now to a question from Laura Meckler of the Wall Street Journal. Hi. Thanks for being here today. Going even deeper into your plan, um, as you've said, you would be replacing private insurance with a government, uh, government organized insurance, uh, or government organized health care. And a few questions going into that. One, what would you say to people who are afraid of losing their coverage? It's sort of scary for people who currently have coverage that they like or maybe coverage they don't love, but at least it's there for them, that that's just going to go away. Also, what would happen to the employer payments that are now funding the system? There's a lot of money coming from, from employers. And finally, how would you compensate the shareholders who have invested in these for-profit companies and which are now going to just go away? Well, you know, first of all, with respect to uh, uh, for-profit shareholders, where there's a conversion of a, um, a for-profit institute institution to not-for-profit, uh, there, there would be a market value compensation that would be involved of, of, of for, to the company. The shareholders, you know, you have to deal with on a basis of where the company's uh, financial structure is. Um, with respect to the kind of coverage that people have now, um, let's go over the numbers again, uh, Ms. Meckler, and that is that 47 million Americans don't have any coverage. So for them, they're immediately going to be covered. What kind of coverage will they have? They'll be able to have the physician of their choice. They'll be able to, uh, to get the care that they need. They just present a card and uh, after they sign their application. And they get the services that they need. They don't have to go through, the doctor doesn't have to go through an insurance agent or anything to get their care. Uh, and it covers all basic health care services, everything. Um, for people who currently have, are, are insured, but there are 50 million who are underinsured. They no longer have the problems of co-pays and, dedu and deductibles. This actually is the end of a system of premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. People no longer have to worry about whether they can afford health care. This is something that really changes things in this country, where, where people will be able to, um, to get the care they need. So today, generally, what happens is that if people find themselves, they feel that they're properly insured, um, there's always going to reach a point where either the premiums are going to go up or the co-pays and, de and the deductibles will go up. Uh, this, is, this continues to happen. So the question is, at what point do people feel that they can't take it any longer? I think more and more Americans are, are coming to that realization. The bottom line is, though, they're covered. This system covers everyone. No one is left out, and it doesn't matter what your financial situation is. So just going back to the first point that you made, if I understood you properly, the, is the government going to be compensating for the entire market capitalization of no, all no, not of these the, companies? Listen, we're not, you know, what it does, if we, let's say there's a hospital that's run by a private entity, mm -hmm. and the hospital is converted from for-profit mm -hmm. to a not-for-profit, uh, there would be a compensation so for the conversion. Who's going to pay that? Pardon? Who, who will be paying that? Well, I'm an investor who is invested the, the, in this hospital. You know, hospital the, the National Health Care Plan repays that. So the government is going to be paying the, the government, all of those people. The government pays that. That's right. People are not, you know, you're not going to have an expropriation here right. of but resources. How, how could the government possibly afford that? We're talking, I, I have no idea how much the full value of all these for-profit um, health care institutions is, but it's got to be By amortizing the cost with Treasury bonds over a period of time, just like you pay for a lot of other capital expenses, period. You know, it's not, it, it's not rocket science in that regard. Yes. We'll go to a question now from Julie Rovner of National Public Radio. Good morning. Thank you for being here, Congressman. Thank While you. we're on the subject of financing, I have a financing question. Um, your plan anticipates the setting of global budgets for the new national health insurance system. How large do you anticipate those budgets would be, and at what rate would they be allowed to grow over time? Well, they're set, they're set at a, a regional level. You know, you have a global budget, but they're... The, the budgets are established regionally. And what that means is this, that hospitals, that you'd look at what hospitals are spending right now, and then you would establish that uh, amount plus an amount that would have to be pegged to either the inflation rate or some formula that would be set by the Quality Control Board. 
but the, but the purpose would be to make sure that hospitals in their global budget can meet all of their needs uh, for staffing and that doctors who will work for either a fee-for-service or if they work for, uh, uh, on salary with the hospital, their uh, costs would be included in that too. But in addition to that, you keep in mind that there's actually a number of different accounts we're speaking of. One is the global budget for operations, but the other one is the budget for capital expenses. The two can't be mixed. They have to be kept separate. So if a hospital needs to make a capital improvement, such as a new building or the purchase of, of equipment, uh, there is a budget for that as well. But since we have a quality uh, control board, there's also going to be some discipline so that there can't be an expansion that can't be justified. People are going to have to make their case. Uh, in addition to that, there will be a budget for, uh, for uh, medical education because you want to, we want to make sure that we have the ability to be able to bring uh, well-trained doctors into the system. So the, the idea of the global budgeting, though, is that when you take the $2.3 trillion that are in the system right now and you uh, distribute the resources on a regional basis, you establish your global budgets, you establish your capital budgets, you establish your budgets for medical um, uh, education, uh, then you provide the services through the operation spending and the capital improvements through the capital improvement budget. But, but this, there is a financial structure here that can work. Uh, the, the, uh, and if I, well, I see my time's run out on this. I'd like to. But the big fear, I think, of many national health systems like this is that what you end up with is rationing uh, with these global budgets, and you end up with having not enough capital spending, or you end up with queues that, that these, these budgets end up with not enough you know, MRIs or CT scanners or not the latest equipment. How do you guard against that? Uh, we, we kind of have rationing now, you could say. 47 million Americans without health insurance, uh, they're not even in line to get rationed. 50 million who are underinsured, they're, you could call them uh, rationees. We have a system right now that is, that is broken, it's not serving people. Now under this system, look, when you consider that the United States already spends uh, more per capita for health uh, care than any other nation in the world. And when you consider by every, you know, by many World Health Organization indices that we're failing to provide for the health care of our, our people, then you know what our obligation is here. You transit to a not-for-profit system, then suddenly people can get the care they need. Will there be an increased demand for health care? I think you could say that. Uh, you could anticipate that. So we want to make sure that the system is strong enough to be able to uh, financially strong enough to be able to absorb the initial cost of people getting assessments, okay? But let me tell you where you save money. You save money on the other end, in acute and critical care. Because what's happening now, there's enormous costs to health care today. Because people do not go to a doctor, there is very little prevention in the system, and people will generally reject the idea of seeing a physician until they're so sick that they just get wheeled into an emergency room. And that's when the costs start to skyrocket. So under this plan, you don't have to have rationing because you have the basic resources are in the system. It's just that you put the cost up front in terms of prevention and care, and you don't have to absorb the extraordinary cost at the end uh, if people are rushing into emergency rooms. So th there's enough money there to cover everyone. No one's going to be denied. St staying on this point, though, there's almost no country in the world that's been able to match its population's underlying demands for health care with a tax-based financing system. There's almost always a gap, a deficit, or as Julie said, there's rationing. In Britain, there's been a deliberate effort to create a private system in, in parallel to the public one. So how is it that you think the U.S. would be different from all these other countries and that U.S. taxpayers would agree to pay collectively for all the health care they expect to consume individually? Well, first of all, you know, the privatizers there are at work in every country, and they're at work in the U.K. They, you know, think about it. If, if health care is such a losing proposition, why are these insurance companies so intent on privatizing it? Why is Humana, for example, trying to grab uh, the uh, Medicare market? Because there's huge amounts of money to be made. We spend twice what other countries spend per capita. And so what I'm saying is that 
if you look at the money that we spend right now, we have enough to meet the needs of the people. We're already paying for a universal standard of care. We're not getting it. The problem is a for-profit system. The problem is that the minute you have a for-profit system, you're going to have people cut out. The minute you have a for-profit system, you're going to have people that just can't afford health care. You're going to have people that are going to lose their homes because the premiums, uh, because the co-pays and the, the deductibles have driven them uh, to that condition. Half the bankruptcies in America are connected to this uh, sorry system where uh, we have uh, a for-profit health care. Now, you know, clearly what I'm talking about is a shift. And the American people need to realize that, that uh, think of the amount of money that a single family pays right now. If U.S. median income, you know, is in the area of $48,000, there's some families that are paying $12,000 a year for, for a family plan, for their health care. So, that's, so that's, one, uh, that's one out of every $4 uh, of their gross. Some are paying a higher rate. Health care spending is causing families to have to organize their entire lives around whether or not they can afford a premium. Or if they're paying for health care because they're worried about going, you know, some, an illness in the family, it then causes other cuts in a family budget, you know, either, either transportation or clothing or college education or food, but something's going to give somewhere. And so what I'm talking about is freeing, is breaking the shackles which these insurance companies have on our political process and freeing up the American family from this uh, yoke which is being placed on their backs. We'll go to a question now from Rick Klein of ABC News. Congressman, your plan would not allow for any for-profit uh, health care providers to participate, although you would give these for-profit providers the opportunity to convert to a not-for-profit status so they could participate. Uh, but that would be a big change. There, there are almost no physicians in the country right now who are organized in non-profit entities. They're, well, they're well, primarily... Run that again. I said most, most physicians are now not organized as not-for-profit entities. They're almost all for-profit at this point. So are the, the labs, the imaging centers. One in five hospitals are actually investor-owned. How do you envision, let's talk about the doctors, how do you envision them reorganizing themselves to be able to participate in this plan? Well, doctors will have either a fee-for-service. You know, right now, Medic Medicare is discouraging doctors by cutting their fees. There's a strategy to privatize Medicare by trying to get doctors to just walk away from, from Medicare. And what I'm talking about is, is giving doctors a fee-for-service that is, that is reasonable. But how do they even organize themselves to get to that point? Uh, how do they organize it? Right now, doctors aren't able to practice medicine. Their insurance companies are telling them what to do. They, they have to check with insurance agents as to whether or not they can pro provide a test or do a procedure or offer surgery. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the whole practice of medicine has been transformed in the, in the latter part of the 20th century to one that uh, had a, a close doctor-patient relationship, to one where the doctor-patient relationship has been severed by insurance interests. So what my plan will do is to give doctors a chance to be able to practice medicine again, reestablish the doctor-patient relationship, give people a, a choice of physicians, and to be able to enable doctors to be able to contract for a fee-for-service that will be a fair fee, usual, customary, and or to be able to uh, have a salary from a hospital. Now, doctors, currently, there are 14,000 physicians for national health care who are supporting this legislation because these doctors understand that this system is unsustainable. This system isn't about health care. It's about insurance care. And the doctors are the ones that have, that have woke up to this. Fifty years ago, the AMA saw this kind of a plan as anathema. And there's still kind of a, a, a residual resistance among some in the medical community. But more and more doctors, as you, and you talk to medical students as well, are starting to understand that they have to change this system. Why do people go into medicine? Most doctors go in there to help people. They don't go in there just to uh, be able to, uh, to be wealthy. Doctors go into medicine to help people. And you know what? More and more doctors are finding that they are able less and less to help the people they dedicated their lives to because it's all about profit for insurance companies. The plan that I'm talking about, that I'm the co-author of H.R. 676, gives doctors a measure of control they haven't had in generations. But what is it about the for-profit health care system on the doctor's end, on the provider's end, uh, the hospital's end, that's just wrong in your view or that, that just doesn't work? I mean, we do now have investor-owned hospitals participating in Medicare and Medicaid, the, the government-run health care plans. Well, they are, but you know what's happening? There's a lot of fraud. I mean, I'm the chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. 
and we're investigating United Healthcare right now. Let me give you an example. What they did in uh, a case in Maryland is there was a young uh, boy, about 12 years old, DeMonte Diamond, and he was entitled to, de to dental care that was under, under a, uh, a government-run program that was administered through United Health. And you know what? The, the 20 or 21 dentists who it was said would be available to serve uh, DeMonte uh, weren't available. And, and you know, they either, either numbers were disconnected or they weren't providing the care that he needed. He had a tooth infection. 12-year-old DeMonte Diamond died because he couldn't get the dental care that he needed. And we did further investigation. And we found out in this county in Maryland that there are thousands of children who were under this program that was, was government-funded but run by a private entity who were being denied the care that they needed over a period of four years. Thousands of children couldn't get the care they needed that they were entitled to. So how do these, how do these companies that have a government contract, these private companies that have a government contract make money? They make money by excluding people from coverage, by making it impossible for people to get the coverage they need. They make money by cheating the American taxpayers. That's what's happening. So my committee, Domestic Policy Subcommittee, which I'm chair, is going deep into this investigation because I think what's happened at United Healthcare is reflected across the board in all of these companies that are private insurance companies that are, that are managing uh, uh, the uh, resources that the government gives them. And that's one of the principal reasons why, Mr. Klein, that I say we've got to get out of this for-profit system. These other candidates all want to stay in it. They want the government, their plan, think about this. Everyone knows what the problem is, people can't afford health care. So, so what Senator uh, uh, Clinton and Senator Edwards plan? Have the government provide more of a subsidy to the private sector, so that means more profits for the insurance companies, but there's not going to be any discipline on premiums, uh, on co-pays or deductibles. So it all becomes about insurance companies. It's not about people. Thank you, Congressman. And Thank we'll, you. And we'll go now to Laura Meckler. Um, moving back to the role that the individual will, would play in a healthcare system that you're envisioning, um, I understand that there would no be, be no premiums aside from the taxes that everybody would be required to pay. But do you foresee deductibles or co-pays or any other sort of cost sharing? I see you're shaking your head. So I'll ask, then, do you think that individuals have any responsibility beyond paying taxes to contribute to their, the, the cost of their, of their health care and also Well, well of, they will. I mean, they'll be yeah. paying taxes. Right. You know, right now, people are paying... 2.9% out of their Medicare. The employers are, are contributing. Well, that system continues. You know, at some point, in order to meet the financial demands of the system, you know, it may be possible or may be required to pay a little more. That's possible, okay? But, and so people are paying. It's not like they're just being given it. They're paying for it. See, and that's why I've said at the beginning that we are already paying for a, a universal system of health care. It's just we're not getting it because one out of every $3 according to a Harvard University study, goes for the activities of the for-profit system. Corporate profits, stock options, executive salaries, advertising, marketing, the cost of paperwork, 15 to 30 percent in the private sector as compared to Medicare's 2 to 3 percent. People are already paying. They're already paying. This isn't like free. Mm -hmm. People are paying for it. Now, if you don't have a job, you're covered. That's the good news. If you happen to be poor, you're still going to get vision care, dental care, mental health care, long-term care, prescription drugs, hearing care, you're covered. See, see, this is a way that we lift up the country. This is the way that we really take people out of poverty. You know, there's, when you look at what's happening, the intensification of poverty in America as, um, as measured by the following indices, um, job and wages, housing, education, access to health care. The American people, particularly people of color, are finding an enormous difficulty being able to make ends meet and having access to the basic necessities of life. I'm not talking about something extra. I'm talking about people's practical aspirations are being ignored because it's all about money. It's all about a for-profit system. So I'm saying that there is, that, there, that we're already paying for this. We're just not getting it. Right. Well, there seems to be a couple of potential problems with that. One is a lot of health economists would say that it's good in terms of keeping control of costs for people to have to pay a little bit out of pocket in order to see a doctor to make sure that they don't just go if they don't really need it. Um, I understand you want people to go when they do need it, but right. there's a, a lot of people would say there needs to be a balance. And there also seems to be a, a risk that people would just sort of view health care as a free lunch and they could just 
and while they have a right to it, but is it also something that they share a responsibility for? Well, uh, right now there's 47 million people who don't have a lunch. Years ago, when I was uh, a city councilman in Cleveland, I had a proposal that I thought would do a lot to protect the environment and help uh, move people around our community efficiently. I proposed free transit. Okay? And the people who attacked the idea threw up their arms and said, my God, if we have free transit, everyone's going to be riding the bus. <laughs> exactly. That's what we want. You want people to use the health care system so that they're healthy. Let's take it in terms of productivity, which I know is something the Wall Street Journal is always concerned about. If you have a, a healthy workforce, you have a more productive economy. See, no one's taking a look at this. If you look at the number of days that people have off that are sick days, and you look at that as, as um, contributing to what's not productive in an economy, then I think if you, if you studied that, you'd find that a healthier workforce is a workforce that has a better morale, is a workforce that can assure a more productive economy and, in the end, greater profits. As a matter of fact, if you look at businesses in this country, let's take the auto industry, for example. The auto industry, according to the Wall Street Journal, has had uh, billions of dollars in health care costs they just can't meet. So what happens? They either, uh, they either tell their uh, workers through contract that they've got to um, accept a smaller deal, or they start to move their costs around, close plants. I mean, this is, you know, our American manufacturing base is being undermined because we can't compete with countries which provide health insurance for their employees. Now, this isn't a WTO issue, by the way, which is very interesting. Congressman, we. That's a terrific point. We will get back to that. But we want to dig just a little bit more deeply into the financing of your plan. Sure. And Julie Rovner has that. Thank you. Um, yes, you, you mentioned uh, before a little bit about how you're going to pay for it. I know you've proposed to, to pay for it one way is by raising the Medicare portion of the payroll tax from its current 1.45% for employers and employees uh, to 4.75%. You've also got a stock transfer tax right. and an income tax surcharge for uh, very wealthy earners. Um, staying with the payroll tax hike, um, why do you think that's a good idea since payroll taxes are the most regressive type of tax and that would hit lowest income people the hardest? Well, actually, lowest income people are the people who are feeling the pinch uh, today in that they can't afford health care. I mean, we have the working poor. Um, half the bankruptcies in America are connected to people not being able to pay hospital bills. Seventy-five percent of those are involved people who uh, had health insurance and they were connected with their job. So, you know, when you look at this concept of the working poor today, which is worth looking at, uh, one of the major things that happens is that under this for-profit system, people are working. They can't afford insurance. Under my plan, they're, they're able to, they get the insurance because it is, it, 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 the cost is covered uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a payroll contribution. Now, this is immeasurably lower than what would happen if they went out and bought health insurance on the market. They just can't, most 47 million Americans can't do it. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers prove the point. And that is, those 47 million Americans, many of them are working. Most of them are working. They just can't afford it. So I'm talking about affordability. And that, and that really is one of the basic concepts here. It's affordability. All these other plans that these other presidential candidates are, are talking about, people still aren't going to be able to afford them. You look at Massachusetts, there were still, there were still costs that people couldn't absorb. So... What are we talking about here? See, I think, by the way, this, this whole debate about health care in this election ends up being a hoax. And the media is part of the problem because it really, they really don't analyze what these candidates are offering, that it's really not going to disturb the system, that it's really not going to provide the care that they need, that there's no difference between Senator Clinton, Senator Edwards, and Mitt Romney, for example. So what kind of choice do the American people have? None. And people are told, well, we just can't do it. Look, FDR was talking about this. Harry Truman was talking about it. Ted Kennedy was talking about this 35 years ago. Why is it? I won't just, why is it that these insurance companies have such a hold? I'm running for president 
to rally the American people on this issue. If and I'll tell you, it is the number one domestic issue. Could I come back to the question just for a second, though? On the payroll tax, though, aren't you worried that by increasing the payroll tax so much, you could end up dampening uh, job growth in that low-wage sector, and you could end up with some of these 47 million people being without health insurance and without a job? Well, actually, no, because, because we are, I, I will maintain that we've had a, a serious undermining of our manufacturing capability because American manufacturers have found that they cannot bear the cost of health insurance, that, our, that businesses are being undermined by this. So the approach that I'm taking is actually good for business. The approach that I'm taking, I mean, look at the advantage that Canada's had for many years over the United States because they provide health care for their people, and, that's, and that basically translates into, uh, into a profit for the manufacturers, and in a sense it's a subsidy per car, but, you know, that's the advantage that Canada has. If we're able to have a national health care plan in this country, our auto industry is going to be more stable. Now, that doesn't mean we don't look at some of the other things affecting our auto industry, because th there are many factors. But, but the cost of health care is a major one. So I'm saying that this is good for American business. American business is getting undermined by this system. And, you know, there's a paradox here, because when, when, you, when you want to get the government involved in reorganizing health care in America, people are going to say, well, we don't want government to do that. Well, you know what? The private sector isn't going to do it because the track that we're on right now, we're really choosing right now. It's between a public and private health care system. And the truth of the matter is we're moving at this very moment towards a totally private health care system. This administration with its Medicare Part D aimed at collapsing Medicare by taking the cost controls off of pharmaceutical companies and driving up the cost to Medicare. That's what's happening. There is an active effort right now to kill Medicare. And so I'm, you know, I'm presenting the other possibility for the American people. And that is that uh, everyone can be covered instead of a system that covers a few uh, at the expense of the health of the many. Congressman, to move to a somewhat different area, the budget of the National Institutes of Health has not grown since 2003. And in fact, when you adjust for biomedical price inflation, it looks like it's back to the level of the late 1990s at best. What would you do if you were elected about the budget, the federal budget for biomedical research, especially since it sounds like you anticipate that the government is going to be spending a lot of money on a new health system? Well, you'd have to. I mean, medical research is an important part although it's not specifically covered by this bill. Uh, you know, medical research is something that we have to take note in because we want to have the progress of medicine continue in this country. So we want to make sure that the uh, National Institutes of Health and all the other programs that are going on around the country receive the research money they need. Now this then becomes a question of what are your priorities? Let's look at what the budget priorities of the United States are right now. Five hundred billion dollars in this budget will go for the activities of the Pentagon. Yesterday, a, a government uh, uh, report, I, was, I think it was a CBO report, was released that shows that we will spend in Iraq $1.9 trillion through 2017 based on current spending trajection, uh, trajectories. As we speak here, with this very important discussion about health care in America, essential, and we have our different ideas about how it can work, as we speak here, our government is, is planning to attack Iran. They're planning to use 30,000 pound bombs. They're retrofitting in this budget. They have funds to retrofit B-52s to carry 30,000 pound bombs to drop on Iran. Con Congressman, if Wait, I may, excuse me, war this is beyond our pay grade here. We're going to stick I tell with health care today. And I'm, I'm going to bring you back, though. I'm to your this guest question. here, but I'm going to tell you something. You cannot take this issue away from war. You just can't because. You're asking how you're going to fund the NIH. A president has to make budget decisions. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on war. We go into another war, it'll be trillions more. Our, our education budgets are getting slashed. Our health care budgets are getting slashed. Our housing budgets are getting slashed for war. So with all due respect, uh, Ms. Ms. Densler, you know, please don't tell me that there's no connection between the money that we spend for war, borrowing money oh, from China. I certainly didn't say that, but I'm assuming but, but you're elected, connected. you won't take us to war with against all due Iran. Respect, what do you connected. do with the NIH budget? Yeah, you, you stop spending money on the Pentagon built for war buildup, and you put the money into the NIH. You put the money not only into health care, you put it into education, you put it into housing, you put it into job creation, you put it into rebuilding the infrastructure. 
I mean, these are choices we make. We can't act as though when we talk about health care, and, and I so appreciate being here, health care doesn't occur in a, you know, a, this health care spending does not occur in a vacuum. And there isn't, you know, this, people need to be aware. It's like, it's time to wake up, and frankly, it's time for people in the media to wake up about the, the impact that this war spending is having on our overall budget. How can we be borrowing money from China, with whom we have about a $240 billion trade deficit, to fund a war in Iraq? We're going to go back to China and borrow money from China or Korea or Japan to fund an attack against Iran? What's happening? You know, we can talk about health care. Let's talk about mental health care. Let's talk about how our country is being so controlled by fear these days that people don't know the choices they have anymore. They're just put in a, a protective reactive mode. I will just note you didn't answer my question about the NIH budget rate I of did growth. Say I, did, I did say I'd fund the NIH budget by, by cutting spending in other areas. I right. thought, I, I thought that was much. understood, but thank you if it wasn't. Okay. We'll move on now to a question from Rick Klein. As you know, there's some 12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. Many or most of them don't have health insurance at this time. How does your plan for national health coverage cover them? And if they're not covered under this plan, how would you propose paying for their pay, uh, pay, paying for their uh, health care? Inevitably, they're going to have to interact with the system at some point. This covers everyone in the United States. Legal, illegal. Covers everyone. Now. You're the doctor. You're in an emergency room. Child gets uh, brought in in an emergency. Do you ask to see the child's green card, or do you treat him? I mean, you know, these are the questions that people are faced with. I'm talking about practical questions here. Here's, here's where this immigration debate has gone. And here's why it, it's so pernicious. Recently, the Congress, the Democratic Congress, took out a provision it had in an earlier bill that would have provided health care coverage for 600,000 children of legal documented immigrants. So we're at the point where we're so divided against ourselves that even the children of legal immigrants aren't being protected by the Democrats. This country, let's talk about health, needs a healing hand where we stop the divisions between ourselves. Everyone's covered under this plan. And we're certainly not going to deny 300 million Americans total health care coverage because you have a few million people who are here who are undocumented. The concern that we have here is you fix the immigration problem. How do you fix the immigration problem? Start with canceling NAFTA and our relationship to the WTO. I know when, when I talk about this, you know, there are some who are going to say, well, you're going out of the topic of health care. Oh, no, I'm not. We need leaders who are holistic thinkers, who are integrative thinkers, who see the connections. But let, let me ask you, though, about holistically and the connections on this. I mean, any kind of immigration bill is going to interact with this health care bill. If you're, if you're offering not just emergency care, the people that go into the emergency room, but preventive care to everyone, wouldn't that make the, the problem with the borders even worse? Wouldn't it encourage people to get here if they know that they can now get free dental care, free mental health care, free preventive care uh, for anything that comes up? Look, common sense say, says that we need to have a policy to control the border. But I would urge you, Mr. Klein, to go into the beginning of the rise of this immigration uh, difficulty in America, you will see that when NAFTA passed, wages collapsed in Mexico and people began a rapid migration across the border. Because I see the connections, cancel NAFTA, renegotiate a trade agreement with Mexico that's based on workers' rights, human rights, and environmental quality principles. When you do that, you lessen the flow, okay? That's number one. We need control at the borders. No question about that. No one disputes that. But we have to understand one of the major factors driving uh, immigration, and, it's, and it's, it's wages. So we have to make sure that Mexico is empowered to be able to take a stand for the wages of their workers. What the United States did under a Democratic administration championing NAFTA was to drive down hopes for workers in this country and in other countries. So I'm talking about changing what is a major factor. Everyone's going to be covered. We want to make sure that we begin to be able to regularize the flow of immigrants across our borders. But, uh, you know, I'm with Ronald Reagan when he said, take down that wall. You know, and if we can take down a wall, 
in, uh, in, in, in Berlin, we should be able to take down a wall separating Mexico and the United States. Thank you, Congressman. And to Laura Meckler. Recently, when the conference report came back on the state children's health insurance program, which was a compromise with the Senate, you voted against it. If you're president and Congress produces some sort of health reform bill that's similarly not to your liking, that doesn't um, call for a government finance system, would you similarly torpedo that bill and tell them to start again? Well, you know, I've been in politics for 40 years. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time. I, I actually, I think I might be one of the few people running for president who has served in a legislative uh, branch, city council, state senate, U.S. Congress, executive branch, mayor of Cleveland, and judicial branch, clerk of courts in the city of Cleveland. I understand a political process. You have to try to work with people. But I also know that when you rally people, the American people, you know, sometimes you have to go over the heads of Congress and go right to the people, that you can get the people to tell their members how they should vote. Now, I'm, I believe that um, I'll be able to work with Congress because I understand politics. But, but Congress will also understand they'll have a president who's an activist, who's pushing health care as a number one domestic concern, as was said in my introduction. Um, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the uh, answer in short. And if you have a follow-up question, I'd like to hear it. Well, well I guess the follow-up I would have is um, if uh, taking another scenario, if you're not elected president, but you're in Congress, and w let's say there's a Democratic president who's proposing something along the lines of what Senators Edwards or Clinton have proposed, um, what would be your reaction as a uh, leader of the single payer group within the House to a Democratic president's proposal along those lines? Well, well let me tell you, I mean, we don't have to say Democrat or, or, or Republican because, frankly, I'm not the most partisan person on Capitol Hill. Oh, well, that's President, just well, let's just say, we already had a, a bill a couple years ago. It was called Medicare Part D. And we were told that if you pass Medicare Part D, more people are going to have prescription drugs. But what the American people didn't know is that they were taking the cost controls off so the pharmaceutical companies could make a windfall, OK? I'm, I look at each bill as to its implications. I actually read the legislation, unlike you know some people. I read the legislation. And when I read the Medicare Part D bill, I said, this is a disaster being sold as an advance in health care. And it was AARP, if you excuse me, that was leading the way. And so what do they end up doing? Selling insurance. What a surprise. So should I take from that response that if Congress or the president or both were to produce, try to produce a bill that was along these lines that built on the private for-profit insurance model that you would veto, veto. And would <laughs> give you me try the to pen. do you try to try to stop it as a member Here. of Congress as well? Here, give me the pen. Yeah. That'll be my first veto, okay? <laughs> Dennis Kucinich, veto, okay? I We're going to you know, Congressman. I, I used that a few times when I was mayor. I know about a veto. We're getting close to the end of our hour, so we're going to move quickly to a question from Julie Rovner. Thank you, Congressman. According to a number of reports, America's public health system is woefully underprepared for another emergency, such as a bioterrorism or pandemic flu or another natural disaster like a devastating series of hurricanes. Or people getting sick. Or people getting sick. Uh, what would you do to improve preparedness? Because one out of every three dollars goes for the for-profit system, that money that goes for health care or for improvement of the infrastructure is scarce. Our health care system is already pretty much stressed. So once you free up that about $700 billion a year, you have a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more flexibility to be able to meet the needs. Now, instead of our model being fear-driven, Let's drive it through hope, hope that families can meet the health care needs and have children that are cared for, have parents that are cared for, have, have mothers, have access to prenatal care, postnatal care, in addition to child care and universal health care. See, we, we really are at a point right now where we have to decide what kind of country we want. Do we want a country that's uh, dedicated to profit for a few at the expense of the many? Do we want a country that's connected to, um, to war at the expense of the domestic needs of the people? Or do we want a country that truly stands 
for the practical aspirations of the people. I mean, that's really, that's how the, my answer would be framed to you. Because, but I'm specifically uh, talking about public health emergencies. Well, you know what, pub public health emergencies, we have a health care infrastructure that is weakened already. We really don't have the capacity right now to be able to meet the needs. I mean, you can start spreading them out, but look what's happened. Look at how many inner city hospitals are being closed. If you go from 1995 to about 2001, you had maybe three, 400 inner city hospitals closed. I know because I helped, you know, I saved a couple of them for a moment and then, you know, one was inevitably And Congressman, lost. we need to move to our final question now because we are at a time emergency, if you will. Uh, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, we gave each of the candidates the same last question. And as you know, it is this. If you're elected president, will you, will, where will health care stand on your list of priorities? Please be as specific as possible in telling us how and when you would proceed with health reform once taking office? Uh, in the first week in office, I will introduce to Congress a bill that is identical to H.R. 676, the bill that I'm the co-author of. You know, you know, unlike other candidates for president, I wrote my own legislation, in this case with the cooperation of Congressman Conyers and the Physicians for National Health Care. It wasn't written by the insurance industry. This bill will be brought before Congress immediately. And I'll push to pass it. I'll ask for help from the Democrats, and I'll go to the Republicans, too, because the fact of the matter is, poverty doesn't know the province of a, just a particular political party. Bankruptcies aren't related to just a particular uh, a member of a particular political party. So people across the board need, need this help. So I'm prepared to make health care the number one domestic priority, and, and I will pursue the health care needs of the American people, not just within the Congress, but going out to the people and rallying the people on this. So if, do you have a follow-up question? No, that, that's really it. Well, then, then let me, if I, it says I have another uh, minute and 50, <laughs> okay. and I'm going to use it. <laughs> Let's ask what kind of a country do we want and start with asking, with recognizing the country that we have. The country we have right now is a country where we are at war against innocent people in Iraq, a mil over a million innocent people, civilian non-combatants have lost their lives in this war in Iraq, in a war based on lies. This war is going to cost trillions of dollars. We're borrowing money from China to pay for the war in Iraq. Well, the health care needs, the education needs, the housing needs, the job creation needs, the infrastructure needs of our country are being ignored. We're preparing for a war against Iran, a nation of 70 million people. As we speak, it's like, wake up, America. We're getting ready for a war against Iran. The money is, is put into the uh, next budget request. And so I'm talking about a different kind of America, one where health care becomes the top domestic priority because you have a president that understands how important it is to American families where peace is seen as part of the way, a path to, uh, to health. We have so much fear in this country. That's not healthy, by the way. We have leaders, we have to ask questions about their own stability when, they, when the only thing that they can see everywhere is, is terror and fear and, and, and aren't thinking about the health of our own people. Congressman, so I'm, we've had so, uh, 10 seconds, and I, thank, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to be here. I thank each of the panelists for their questions. But I, I stand ready to lead this country to a new era in health care for all. And Universal, <laughs> single payer, not for profit. And we thank you for a very lively discussion today, Congressman Kucinich. And I want to say thank you also to my colleagues, Laura Meckler, Julie Rovner, and Rick Klein. This concludes our presidential forum on health care with Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Democratic candidate for president. We'll be back here again at the Kaiser Family Foundation in Washington, D.C. for the next presidential health forum. For the schedule on that, please go to www.health08.org. I'm Susan Denser. Thank you and good day. Thank you. Thank you.